Jean Schnupp here. Welcome to another Savvy Sightseer video vacation. This time we are venturing out west to see one of the seven natural wonders of the world, along with some other very impressive natural sights guaranteed to astound and inspire you. Whether just to admire the varied and stunning scenery, or to challenge sheer walls by climbing, or to bike, hike, meander, whatever, our largely untouched national parklands and canyons can appeal to virtually everyone. We will start in Arizona with one of the most famous canyons in the world, the Grand Canyon. Then we'll move up into the Navajo Nation with Monument Valley, and over to Utah for Bryce Canyon and Zion National Park, and then back into Navajo Nation with a stop at the very dramatic Antelope Slot Canyon. I have to give you a little bit of a word of warning here. I had to yank out my trusty old thesaurus for this program. You run out of adjectives to describe the many beautiful vistas. So join me now as we go westward. There are wonders of the world, and then there are wonders of the world. Many point to the Great Wall of China, or the pyramids as examples. But those are man-made, and as wondrous as they are, I feel they take a back seat to naturally occurring, stunningly magnificent wonders. Included in the top seven of those is the truly awe-inspiring 277-mile-long Grand Canyon. Mother Nature took her time with this sculpture, crafting it over millions of years, using the Colorado River as her gouge to carve out incomparable landscapes of staggered bands of colorful rock, deep crevices, and sheer walls up to a mile tall. The first non-natives to see the canyon were reportedly Spanish explorers searching for the fabled seven cities of gold in 1540. In response to their quest for an easy water route to the Pacific, they were led by native Hopi people to see a great river. Their hopes, though, were dashed by the sight of a daunting rush of the Colorado. They deemed it impenetrable wasteland, a sentiment repeated more than 300 years later by an Army Corps of Engineers leader, Joseph Ives. In 1857, he declared the canyon altogether valueless, a profitless locality that resembles a vast ruin. He added that once you're there, there is nothing to do but leave. He predicted it would be forever unvisited and undisturbed. It wasn't until another decade passed that John Wesley Powell, a geologist with a love of the outdoors, who was intent on making the first scientific survey of the region, set sail down the Colorado and saw the beauty, not just challenge, of the canyon. He and most of his band of explorers survived the harrowing, months-long, treacherous journey in 1869 and then told the world a different story from his predecessors. He called it a most sublime spectacle and asserted that no words nor symbols could adequately represent it. Those who came before him who had failed to appreciate what they saw have been thoroughly proven wrong. Far from worthless, the canyon attracts some five million visitors a year and reportedly generates nearly a half million dollars in annual revenue. Just past the Grand Canyon Visitor Center is Mather Point, where most visitors get their first glimpse of the mighty natural wonder. It's surreal to go from concrete and cars to this, and a view spanning 10 miles without a car in sight. The point was named for a wealthy industrialist, avid conservationist, and supporter of public lands, Stephen Mather, who became the first director of the National Park Service in 1917. And yes, those are people precariously perched on the cliffs. According to park personnel, about a dozen people die in the canyon each year. Some from just being plain stupid. When I was there in May 2022, the region was experiencing an abnormally ferocious windstorm. I am still amazed I didn't actually see anyone go over the edge while they challenged nature just to get the perfect selfie. While it is easy for visitors to get caught up with the fantastic views, 
they should remember that the park is not just something to look at. For many, it has been home. For countless generations, Grand Canyon has been a residence and sacred space for 11 different tribes within the Southwest, some of which are more familiar names to us, such as Navajo, Apache, Hopi, Paiute, Yavapai, and Zuni. A flip side of the COVID restrictions is that the formerly in-person presentations by these tribal members has now been converted to video for everyone to enjoy, even those who never set foot in the state. For the entire series, go to this website. Now here's the beauty of watching a video program. You can pause now and copy the link so you make sure you get it exactly. <clears throat> Although the South Rim Trail from Mather Point West is paved and much of the way with guardrails, some people with height fears could still be a bit overwhelmed. The good news is they can enjoy the scenery anyway, safely and in blessed air co in the summer and heat in the winter. About three quarters of a mile from Mather is Yavapai Point, where a viewing station gives new meaning to the term picture window, through which I took this photo. It's a nice improvement over the original 1928 open air version of the building. For those who don't want to hike along the rim at all to get to this view, the Yavapai Point is a stop on the park's very convenient shuttle bus route. In addition to the views at Yavapai, there's also a geology museum showing off beautifully crafted artwork, three-dimensional models, photos, and interpretive panels which allow visitors to see and understand the complicated geologic story of the area. This section of the South Rim Trail from Yavapai called the Trail of Time gives you a good idea of how easy the walk is in many places. The area here is equal parts view and information for those interested in learning what happened here over the course of more than two billion years. Along the timeline trail are a series of exhibits that explain how the Grand Canyon and its rocks formed. About every three feet, a marker explains roughly over a million years of development. From this vantage at Hopi Point, you get a great view of the Colorado River. From its inception in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, the river cuts 1,450 miles in seven states, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, and California, and then continues on into Mexico. For a sense of how native Indians lived right on the edge of the canyon more than a hundred years ago, there's the Hopi House, built in 1905 by female architect, a standout of the era, Mary Coulter. She took her inspiration from a 900 year old North American Indian village in Navajo County, Arizona. For the building, she used native materials and followed a standard Hopi design. For example, going with small windows and low ceilings that minimize the harsh desert sunlight and lent a cool and cozy feel to the interior. Some adjustments did have to be made for the Grand Canyon location and purpose. A true Hopi home would have had an entrance on the roof accessed by a wooden ladder, which could easily be moved up and into the home to create a solid defense against invaders. However, a rooftop entrance was not optimum for the type of visitors drawn here. So Coulter conceded the point and Hopi House uses a ground level front door for easier tourist access. Other than that, Coulter insisted her construction be authentic right up to the ceiling. Typical of the Hopi style, it has saplings, grasses, and twigs with a mud coating that rest on top of peeled log beams. This building served initially both as a home for the Hopi craftsmen who brought it to life, while the ground floor housed Indian arts and crafts for sale to travelers staying at the nearby historic El Tovar Hotel, the first luxury accommodation in the canyon being built at the same time by the Fred Harvey Company. It was for the influx of tourists who had started arriving by train on a spur of the Santa Fe Railroad which is accessed just about a three minute walk downhill from the Hopi House. There's also a convenient shuttle stop there. Before we move north from the Grand Canyon, I wanted you to have one last look, not the one dimensional version though. Here you can take in the full scope of it 
and ask yourself, how did the people in settler days persevere to explore its vastness? About 150 miles northeast of Grand Canyon is Monument Valley, a 30,000 acre Navajo tribal park established in 1958 and located on the border of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. It's just a small part of the Navajo re Reservation, which covers 16 million acres, or about 27,000 square miles. The Navajo Nation is managed via agreements with the United States Congress as a sovereign Native American nation. The Navajos are believed to have been the first group of people to establish themselves in the valley roughly a thousand years ago. Today, the Navajo Nation, geographically the largest Native American reservation in the United States, claims approximately 300,000 enrolled members. An individual must be at least one quarter Navajo in order to be enrolled as a tribal member, according to Navajo law. Increasingly, the tribe prefers to be referred to as Diné, literally meaning the people in their native language, as opposed to the more Pueblo-based name of Navajo. The valley's landscape is so striking it is said to be one of the most photographed places on earth, and it frequently serves as backdrop for Hollywood westerns and other films. Perhaps the most famous non-western to have a climactic episode on this very road, U.S. Route 163, was Forrest Gump, and the spot where star Tom Hanks announced his epic run had finally come to an end. Monument Valley is characterized by towering sandstone rock formations up to a thousand feet tall. Sculpted over the millennia, they have earned the region a sort of acclaim from National Geographic for having the most famous collection of buttes in the world. Buttes are defined as isolated hills with steep sides taller than they are wide, and with a flat top. Merrick Butte here, named after a soldier who served under Kit Carson, is a perfect example. Despite being within the Navajo Nation, the names given to the Buttes are not derivatives of Indian terms. They are entirely from the fanciful minds of settlers, generally based on personal connections or how the Buttes struck them. You can easily see the logic with some, but others are pretty creative and do stretch the imagination a bit. The top first two pictures, called the left and right mittens, are easy to accept as they face each other across a stretch of valley. Then there's the solo thumb jutting up. But I do have trouble with elephant rock, although many people say they can see the shape to some extent. The buttes in the lower left form the three sisters. On the right is John Ford's Point, which pays tribute to the Hollywood film director. During the mid-1900s, Ford was the first to use this location for many of his movie scenes, starting in 1939 with Stagecoach. It was this location that helped establish the image of the American West in the minds of the rest of the world. A Navajo horseman is available to enhance your photo by riding out on a ledge for five dollars so that you can take a photo of your own that looks like so many in film including the 2013 version of the lone ranger almost blending in with the dramatic natural scenery are homes of some native americans the dome structures are called hogans traditionally made of wooden poles covered in sand packed down with light water and layered over the doorway of each Hogan opens to the east so good blessings could ride in on the beams of the rising sun. Today, many Navajo families still live in Hogan's, although somewhat more updated with roofs constructed of wood or cement. In some cases, trailers or more modern houses are tending to replace them. Every family though, even if they live most of the time in a newer home, must have the traditional Hogan for ceremonies and to keep themselves in balance. By shocking contrast, the inside bears no resemblance to the exterior. And huge juniper logs are pieced together like a puzzle without using nails or mortar of any kind. 
There's a central hole in the roof which serves a few purposes. One is for smoke from the fireplace to escape. Another is more symbolic. It joins Mother Earth with Father Sky. There is no division between the two realms in the Navajo tradition. There is much that holds special meaning in the Navajo world, where the female rules the clan and the tribal line goes down the mother's side. This hogan itself is built round like a woman's womb. Nine pillars hold it up, representing the nine months of pregnancy. And when one enters the hogan, it's traditional to walk clockwise within. Moving into Utah, we come to Old Bryce Town at the edge of Bryce Canyon National Park. Locals think this gives the hotel and restaurant lined Main Street more of an authentic Wild West feel. I'm not sure how authentic people consider the shops, but it does give a bit of a comic relief to all the dramatic, truly authentic landscapes in the region. The first thing you should know about 36,000 acre Bryce Canyon is that it isn't technically a canyon at all. It's considered a collection of amphitheaters or bowl shaped areas. It got the erroneous name from a pioneer, Ebenezer Bryce, who had settled here in 1870 to do some cattle ranching and built a road into a canyon nearby, which everyone then referred to as Bryce's Canyon. But it's not for this kitschy frontier facade town that people make the trek to Bryce about four hours northeast of Las Vegas, Nevada, and about the same distance south from the Utah State Capitol, Salt Lake City. Rather, it's the striking and colorful park itself, and possibly a bit of magic as well, that draws over one and a half million visitors a year. Park rangers have a term for the reaction of visitors when they first glimpse the amphitheater of sandstone formations that the park is famous for. They call it the Bryce moment. And now for your own Bryce moment. What's truly amazing about places like Grand Canyon and Bryce is why there are so many designated viewing points. It's all the same canyon or amphitheater, but from each point, the view can be totally different because of the angles of how you see the rock formations and the way the light and shadows play across them. The vast array of irregular rock spires in Bryce are called hoodoos. Early residents, the South Paiute's name for, the, for today's Bryce Amphitheater, certainly captured the visual. It translates to the red rock standing like a man in a hole. The tribe believed the rocks to be ancient legend people, turned into stone by the trickster god Coyote as a punishment for their selfish and disrespectful behavior. Actually, they are tall spires consisting of soft rock that is eroded away from a harder core. While these are not unique to Utah, Bryce does have the largest concentration found anywhere on Earth. That's due to a sort of perfect storm of conditions. Hard and soft rock combined, persistent rapid freezing and warming in short periods of time, and water. Nighttime snow melts during the day, and trickles down into the rock, then expands when it refreezes later in the day, wedging the rock apart. Bryce Canyon experiences over 170 of these freeze-thaw days during the year. From different lookout plateaus around the amphitheater, the view can be completely new. Here at Bryce Point, the southernmost area of the park, you find great sprawling and panoramic views. Although his name lives on at the National Park, Ebenezer Bryce only lasted a few years in the region, given it wasn't really conducive to cattle ranching. Well, it's a hell of a place to lose a cow, he said. Walking along the rim from sunset to sunrise points on about a half mile paved path proves the point of perspective. At sunrise point, the colors are truly vivid Iron oxide minerals supply the vibrant red, oranges, and yellows of some of the cliffs, and patches of pink and purple are caused by mag manganese oxides, and they add to the rainbow of color. And then there's Sunrise Point, at an elevation of about 8,100 feet. This is a very popular spot, 
given it is an easily accessible viewing point and nearby one of the shuttle stops. From the lookout, you get a great 360 degree view of the bowl, making a wonderful choice for stargazers. In 2019, Bryce Canyon National Park officially gained international dark sky status. Bryce Canyon's high elevation, clean air, and remote location creates some of the darkest skies in the country. During a new moon on a clear weather night, you can see thousands of stars and the spectacular band of the Milky Way galaxy shooting across the sky. Just outside of Bryce, we find two more hoodoos, dubbed Salt and Pepper, and a great close-up look at the formations. By contrast, the highlight of Zion National Park actually is a canyon, and for a change, we're going in on the ground level and looking up at the steep walls instead of down from the rim. Zion is a deep and narrow gorge carved out by the Virgin River through southwestern Utah. It stretches about 15 miles long, and almost 3,000 feet deep in places. It is Utah's oldest and most visited national park and annually hosts an average of about four and a half million visitors. That level of popularity eventually overwhelmed the park and drastic measures had to be taken. In 2000, Zion became the first national park to mandate shuttle transportation only during most of the year ensuring there's no traffic jams or blaring horns to interrupt the quiet pleasures of nature. The park shuttle bus travels along a nearly eight mile route, stopping at nine keep jumping off, key jumping off spots for various trailheads and views. Like the Grand Canyon, early Spanish explorers didn't think much of it other than something to cut through from what is today Santa Fe, New Mexico to Los Angeles, California, and skirting around Hopi lands in Arizona. It wasn't until the mid-1800s when Brigham Young, head of the Mormon Church, set out to avoid religious persecution and find a place that would be for them an American Zion. He and his 10,000 followers stopped their search at a salt lake in a valley. They determined it was isolated enough for them to settle in undisturbed. In 1851, Congress created the territory of Utah and installed Young as its first governor. In 1858, Young sent a missionary to explore the Upper Virgin River region, and Nephi Johnson became the first white man to enter a magnificent canyon. Word spread about his discovery, encouraging more explorers and ultimately sightseers to make the trek. Artist Thomas Moran, who captured the landscape in his Valley of Babbling Waters painting, observed that the glory of the scenery and stupendous scenic effects cannot be surpassed. And so, of course, crowds teamed into Utah. President Woodrow Wilson pronounced Zion a national park in 1919, and it opened to the public the following year. Zion Canyon is considered the crown jewel of the state's national park system. It's one of those places that has something for every lover of the outdoors. Biking and walking paths, some of which are paved, hiking trails ranging from beginner to very challenging, a nature center and human history museum tracing populations from prehistoric tribes to the Mormons. One early settler remarked, a man can worship God among these great cathedrals as well as he can in any man-made church. This is Zion, and so it came to be known as that. Given the religious nature of the earliest settlers, it's no surprise many of the massive peaks have been christened with names pulled from the Bible, like temples or towers of the Virgin, and here court of the three patriarchs, identified as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then there's Angel's Landing. When Methodist minister Frederick Fisher came upon this one in 1916, he said it was so high only an angel could land on it. The trail leading to the landing is considered one of the U.S.'s greatest hikes, and many braved the five, almost five and a half mile round trip, tagged as strenuous. It's characterized by 1,000 foot drop-offs. In some particularly challenging areas, 
There's a handrail of sorts, but it is only a heavy metal chain bolted to the rock walls. The reward for braving the trek is, of course, the view at an elevation of nearly 1,500 feet, higher than any building west of the Mississippi. Like the park itself, this hike became overrun by visitors, prompting new measures in 2022. Everyone who wants to experience the untamed adventure and get a classic photograph from Angel's Landing now needs to have a permit. Hikers must enter a lottery for a chance to get the coveted pass, issued in three time slots, and tentatively limited to 120 people per hour on the trail. A phenomena seen in various areas of Zion are gardens of ferns and flowers that cling to the sheer mountain walls. Unlike their soil-based cousins, they are able to establish themselves in rock where they thrive. These so-called hanging or weeping gardens develop when water seeps in through the top sandstone layer and then, when it hits a hard rock layer, is diverted to flow horizontally along cracks until it oozes out of the porous sandstone to nourish the shrubs. Some areas in the park have more practical names like the Emerald Pools, which at one time took on a green hue from algae. Hikers have a choice of challenge and view levels between the easier accessed lower pool to the more challenging and considered best upper pool. Unfortunately, given the recent drought, water levels were very low and even the Virgin River itself going through the canyon was not very robust in 2022. But still, it provided a great spot to sit and relax and give me a peaceful view while I took a lunch break on a convenient fallen log. The end of the shuttle line is just the starting point for more adventures. From the Temple of Sinawaba, named by Union Pacific Railroad Public Relations Exec as a tribute to the Southern Paiute Coyote God, the railroad had a vested interest in contributing to the park's allure. It had added a spur line in 1923 to encourage tourism, and in 1925 collaborated with the National Park Service to build a lodge, the only overnight accommodations in the park. Visitors can again opt to follow an easy walk the riverside for about a mile, and then take pictures of pretty waterfall and call it a day, or they can bump the adventure up a notch and continue on into the Virgin River to hike about three and a half miles into the Narrows. At barely 20 feet wide in some areas, it is the skinniest section of Zion Canyon. Given its narrowness and steep walls, Zion is technically termed a slot canyon. A very different type of slot canyon is on the Navajo Nation's land near Page, Arizona, and the Utah border. Upper Antelope Canyon was discovered in 1931 by Sue Sosie, a Navajo girl, then 12 years old, herding her sheep. The tribal name for the phenomena translates to the place where the water flows through the rocks. The tribe con considers the canyon to be spiritual and very sacred to the Navajo culture and way of life. They view it as a symbol of the gifts of Mother Nature, the passage of time, and the fact that there are things larger and greater than themselves. The forces of nature have pulsed through this canyon, leaving beautiful swirling formations behind. Lit by sun pouring in through the open top, the walls, some 120 feet tall, take on stunning shades of orange and yellow, pinks and grays. Due to the importance to their heritage, the tribe made the Antelope Canyon a Navajo tribal park in 1997, and hikers cannot enter Upper or its sister Lower Antelope Canyon without being accompanied by a Navajo guide. Shaped by millions of years of water and wind erosion, the magnificent canyon was named by early visitors for the herds of pronghorn antelope that once roamed the area. Upper is shaped like an upside-down V, narrow at the top and wide at the base. The walk through the canyon is a good quarter mile and is characterized by the endless oohs and ahs of visitors. The entrance to Lower is about seven and a half miles away, and that canyon is just as beautiful, but more challenging. Unlike Upper with its ground level entrance and trail, Lower is accessed by means of steep ladders that take you down to the canyon floor for about a mile tour. 
These are said to be the most photographed slot canyons in the world and are often the preloaded screensaver on computers. Shadows change the look completely, although the wider base of the two canyons in places upper is a bit tight. Notice how narrow the passage is here. Nature isn't done with the canyons and flash floods are a constant concern. In 1997, one of the deadliest floods hit when a 40 foot high wall of water swept through Lower Antelope Canyon, killing 11 hikers. The jutting out rock on the right, nicknamed George Washington by someone with a creative imagination, is evidence of ongoing changes. At one time, the floor was more than six feet below the imagined chin line. Now it nearly touches it. It seems that big floods sweep the fine red sand out, but smaller floods bring it back in, and efforts to shovel out the sand were fruitless. When the angle is just right, beams of sunlight radiate down into Upper Canyon like Star Trek transporter beams. Unfortunately, I was there a bit early for the full effect of the famed sunbeams, but one extraordinary photographer hit it just right resulting in the most expensive photograph ever sold. Australian photographer Peter Lick achieved a place in art history when his monochrome Phantom sold for a record-breaking, wait for it, six and a half million dollars in late 2014. The color version called Ghost surprisingly didn't sell for anything near the shocking price of Phantom with its eerily beautiful black and white scene capturing a ghost-like cloud of dust. Certain textures and contours found in nature lend themselves beautifully to black and white photography, said Lick. The intensity of contrasting light and dark spaces was surprising, but made for some of the most powerful images I've ever created, he added. I like to end all of my programs with the words of Dr. Seuss. Sometimes you don't appreciate the moment until it becomes a memory. And I like to add to that, always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure those memories. I hope you've enjoyed your journey through the incredible national parks and canyons of our Southwest. If you have any questions about this program, email me or use the contact page on my website, which is also where you can visit any of my European destinations. And you could also check my programs tab there to see what I'll be presenting, either virtually or in person. If you liked this look at America's Western Wonders, you might want to catch my Arizona Amazing and Awesome program. That one focuses on the incredible diversity of the state beyond the Grand Canyon, from Phoenix through deserts to Utah's border, with so much in between. Well, so long for now.